from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, um, I think we're re ready, and we have uh, Lewis Bayard from the Washington Post, our other great friend of the National Book Festival is, is the Washington Post, and Lewis is here to make uh, Professor Carter's introduction. Thank you, thank you. And on behalf of the Post, I'm, I don't actually, I'm not actually an employee, I just work there sometimes, but uh, I want to um, welcome you all to the, the Post has been a sponsor of this festival for, uh, for since its inception, and this is a, a truly exceptional lineup of uh, authors we have today. Um, and I will say, as a writer, writers, if we're to be honest, are wretched creatures consumed by unseemly emotions, envy, most of all. We envy the writers who write better than us, sell more, say more, do more. And so we come green-eyed monsters to Stephen L. Carter. <laughs> it's not enough that he should have a distinguished academic career that included clerking for Thurgood Marshall and teaching for nearly three decades at Yale Law School. It's not enough that he should be a highly respected international commentator on everything from race to religion to foreign policy. It's not enough that he should have eight honorary degrees, no. Stephen L. Carter had to go and become a novelist, too. A best-selling novelist, his first time out. Yeah. With the Emperor of Ocean Park, 10 years later, he is one of the top legal thriller writers in the land. The sound you hear is teeth gnashing all around you. And to make things even worse, Mr. Carter has come up with a ridiculously cool idea for his latest book the kind you might have come up with if you were really smart and well-educated and <laughs> Stephen Carter. The impeachment of Abraham Lincoln is a fictional speculation about what would have happened if Lincoln had survived the assassination attempt only to be subjected to an impeachment trial that puts his political fate in the hands of, among other people, a young African-American woman. It's a book that's bound to change how we see Lincoln and Washington, D.C., and post-Civil War America. So today we swallow down our envy, and we welcome back a local guy made good, a man who was born here in D.C. Um, and lived in all four quadrants, and uh, who returns time and again in print and in person to tell us something we didn't know and take us somewhere we haven't been. Please welcome Stephen L. Carter. Well, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. It, uh, it is a great pleasure to be back in Washington, which is my hometown, and it's great to be back um, uh, at a time when the Redskins have a quarterback, uh, <laughs> which you have to understand, see, you all are young. You, you have to understand, I, I go back to, you know, the uh, Redskins of the early 60s, and you talk, you think you've seen bad teams in recent years. You should have been going to those games, I, I, it, was, uh, it was an experience, uh, not one to be uh, repeated and certainly not one to be bragged uh, about, except for one thing, in those days on game day you could easily walk up to the stadium and buy a ticket if you happened to want to go to, uh, uh, to the game. Uh, and I'd actually love to stand here and talk about sports uh, for the next 45 minutes, but I, I don't suppose that our hosts would be very happy uh, uh, with that. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to say a couple of things about my novel, The impeachment of Abraham Lincoln, and I'm going to also answer some of the most, uh, uh, most asked questions that I had on my book tour in July, and then um, I'll take your questions, which I, I, I assume you all have some, or brickbats as the case, uh, case may be. Uh, but I, I want to begin by explaining something. Notwithstanding the title of my novel, please understand that it's a novel. I, it's, I'm, I'm a Lincoln fan. I've been a Lincoln fan since I was a kid, I'm not suggesting Lincoln should have been impeached. I'm not suggesting that had he survived, he would have been impeached. I'm suggesting that as a writer of fiction, it's an interesting question. Wouldn't it be fun to create a murder mystery and legal thriller, courtroom drama, I should say, maybe, set against the background in which he is being impeached? That's all I was trying to do. I was trying to write to have some fun uh, with a president I've always admired and uh, writing about an era that's always fascinated me. So I want to tell you just a little bit about 
the story and its background, both historical background and some of my reasons for writing it, and then I'll go on and, and uh, tell you some of the questions I'm gonna ask the most. So as background, let's just consider for a moment. Let's think of what most people would say is real life, real history. So in real history, or our common history, on night of April 14th, 1865, uh, John Wilkes Booth sneaks into the presidential box at Ford's Theater and shoots the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, in the back of the head. The president's dying body is carried across the street to the second floor of a rooming house where he expires early the next morning. That same night, as many of you know, as part of the Vaster conspiracy, the vice president of the United States, Andrew Johnson, was supposed to be murdered, as was Secretary of State Seward, who many people in the North and especially in the South believed was the evil genius who really ran the administration. So the fellow who was supposed to kill Secretary of State Stewart broke into Seward's house and managed to stab the, the secretary several times, but was finally fought off by uh, Stewart's son and a house servant. The fellow who was supposed to kill the vice president, and in those days, the vice president just lived in a hotel. He had no guards or anything. He was just a guy. Uh, so the fellow was supposed to kill the vice president he needed a little shot of liquid courage. So he, s he went to a bar and he had a drink. And they had another drink. <laughs> and you know how it goes. Then he had another drink. And suddenly it was the morning and he never gotten around to killing the vice president. <laughs> so, so Johnson actually slept through the entire uh, uh, event. All right. So that's the real history. And then Johnson, of course, became president. Now, in my imagined history, what happens is this. On the night of April 14, 1865, John Wilkes Booth creeps into the presidential box at Ford's Theater and shoots the 16th president in the back of the head. The president's dying body is carried across the street to a rooming house where he's laid out in a room on the second floor. But unlike what happened in real history, he begins to recover. The, wound, the, the bullet was a few millimeters away from where it actually struck his head, and although he is slightly debilitated for the rest of his life, uh, he actually recovers from the wound. Now, in my story, uh, Secretary of State Seward is almost killed and, in fact, is so badly wounded he never leaves his house again. Uh, he lived uh, right across from the White House. Uh, and in my story, the vice president is murdered. The vice president of the United States dies. So when my story begins in 1867, Lincoln is still alive. He's still president. There's no vice president. That's actually important. Now, in my story, uh, he's facing an impeachment trial. You're saying, how could this happen? Who would have thought to do such a thing? We tend to forget nowadays how very unpopular Lincoln was in his own party. The, Re the radical Republicans who ran Congress at the time, very strong abolitionists, they led the fight against slavery, uh, were very heavily uh, well-educated men from the Northeast and, fr and from, what then some, from what some people in those days called uh, the Near West, which was basically Ohio, uh, very well-educated uh, and here they see this guy, Lincoln. He's from the far west, which was Illinois, um, which means he's by definition some uneducated rube from the frontier. Um, he had no formal education. He was from a state they looked down their nose on already. He had a funny accent, a western accent. And many historians believe he also had a high, reedy voice, which is described by a number of people who heard both his inaugural addresses and the Gettysburg Address. And in addition to that, a lot of leaders of his party thought they were his moral superiors. They were more anti-slavery than he was, they thought. They believed they would prosecute the war better. As late as March of 1865, leaders of the Republican Party were still trying to think of if there was some way they could get Lincoln aside and put, as one of them said, a fitter man uh, in the White House. So in my story, I somewhat exaggerate the degree of their disdain for him to consider the possibility that since they were trying to find a way to put him aside, why not use impeachment as the way to put him aside? So the theory is that he faces impeachment. Remember, under the Constitution, the House votes a bill of impeachment, and the trial is in the Senate. He faces impeachment, and there are four charges, of which I'll tell you two. The other two you have to look at the book uh, to see. The, the two I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you because they are unquestionably true. They are things that really happened. 
uh, bearing in mind that, of course, in my tale, the impeachment is political. These aren't necessarily the real reasons, but they are the actual charges. So the first charge involves the suspension of habeas corpus. And in those days, the writ of habeas corpus was still, still described by most lawyers in Blackstone's words as the first and greatest of our liberties. The writ of habeas corpus is the reason that if you're locked up, uh, the government has to produce you before a judge if ordered to do so or let you go. Lincoln suspended the habeas writ of habeas corpus in se progressively, he did it several different ways, at several different uh, places before finally suspending it nationwide in 1862. Uh, and when I say suspended, he simply on his own authority simply directed military officials uh, not to release people on writs of habeas corpus. This is at a time when the military was busily locking people up on grounds that they were traitors. And so, for example, Maryland, and I know those of you who live in Maryland may not like to hear this, Maryland was not only a slave state, but one of the real hotbeds of secession. The only reason the state of Maryland did not secede was that the President of the United States sent Union troops into Maryland, which is against the law, uh, to shut down the legislature and keep it from meeting and lock up any politicians or anyone else who expressed secessionist sentiments and in that manner kept Maryland in the Union. The President's theory was if Maryland left the Union, Washington is cut off and the capital left to move north to Philadelphia and the war would practically be over. So one charge is that he suspended the writ of habeas corpus, unquestionably true. The second charge, also unquestionably true, uh, w had to do with censorship. Uh, that uh, the administration, not through Lincoln himself, but largely through the agency of either the military or the Office of the Secretary of State, um, shut down a number of opposition newspapers for varying periods of time. When we say opposition here, we don't mean political. It, it, this, this isn't partisan. People who were publishing things against the war that in the president's judgment, or I should say, in, I'm sorry, in the administration's judgment, were untrue and were also retarding the war effort. That's very well known to history. What we often forget was also done at the front was that generals on their own authority, if there were reporters who were issuing dispatches uh, that the generals thought were untrue, uh, could arrest the reporters and uh, subject them to military courts martial. That also happened. So these are things that actually occurred. And so these are two of the charges in, in the impeachment uh, brief. Uh, and there are some others that I won't, uh, won't get into because I'd have to tell you too much of the story and you'll have to find them out for yourself. Now, I'm not saying that these are impeachable offenses. I'm saying it's an interesting question because, you know, nowadays there's a tendency whenever any, it doesn't matter which party you are, well, this is Washington, you're all the same party, but, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but nowadays whenever there's a president and people don't like something he does, everybody says, impeach him, impeach him, impeach him. The things presidents have done in history, Lincoln held more power in his hands than any president we've ever had. No one else was close. No one else was close. Held more power and used it in a very determined way to bend all effort toward winning the war without regard to what now people would talk about as, as civil liberties. He was determined that nothing was important as winning the war. So in my story, there's an impeachment trial. The whole sec second half of the book is basically an impeachment trial in which you have various witnesses and people are arguing about this. Now, I told you that the story, the impeachment, the whole story is built around a murder mystery. I won't tell you who gets murdered. You have to read to chapter three uh, to get to that. I will tell you uh, that most of the story is told from the point of view of a young woman named Abigail Kanner. Now, you have to understand there's a lot of books about Lincoln, 15,000 books about Lincoln, uh, according to uh, the Lincoln uh, Library and Museum in Springfield. And of those 15,000, maybe 1,000 of them are novels about, uh, about Lincoln. There's a lot of novels about Lincoln. I've read only a few. But what's interesting about Lincoln fiction is that with minor exceptions, it is almost always told from the point of view of someone in the White House or very close to Lincoln and so on. I was interested in an outsider's perspective. And so I invented this young woman. Her name is Abigail Kenner. She's a, a, a free black woman in Washington, D.C. in the 1860s. She's just graduated from what was then called the Oberlin Collegiate Institute which was one of the first colleges in America to educate men and women, black and white, side by side. There are a lot of colleges that tell you on their website when they started educating women, and the great majority of them 
had separate men's and women's campuses. They didn't actually educate people even in the same classroom. Oberlin did. Same classroom, same dining hall, same everything, black, white, men, women. It was an innovation at the time. So she's graduated from Oberlin. She's been taught that she can be anything she wants to be. She comes back to Washington and she wants to be a lawyer. Now this is at a time, you have to understand, when there were about six, seven at the most, eight black lawyers in the United States. We don't have an exact count. Uh, and there are no female lawyers in the United States. Uh, some states at that time have rules barring women. Others, it just had never come up as an issue. But she has this in her head. She's ambitious. She wants to, uh, she wants to be a lawyer. Uh, in those days, there were no law schools in the sense in which we think of them today. Most people became members of the bar by being a, uh, a clerk, uh, often a even starting as a copyist, as it was called, in a law office and learning the law that way. She ends up getting a job as a clerk in a law office in Washington. Uh, the conceit of the story is that they knew she was a woman when they hired her, they didn't know she was black. How could they? It was all done by correspondence from, from Oberlin. The law firm she is employed by ends up being involved in Lincoln's defense, although they work very hard to keep her from being involved in Lincoln's defense uh, in any way, although she's there. And a lot of the story, well, there are plays in the story that revolve around her different efforts to become more involved, their efforts to break through various barriers around the city. But I wanted to use an outsider in part because I wanted to look at the 1860s from a perspective we don't see that much in history. What was it like to be a free black family right after slavery ended? What was Washington like? Which I worked, I worked very hard on trying to get Washington DC right. What was Washington like in those times? What would her life have been like, her daily life, and so on? And also, I, I, I just think murder mysteries are much more interesting when they're told from the perspective of someone who can be rushing down an alley while someone's chasing them and not be somebody famous who could just hail a police officer and get a ride back to the White House in a carriage or something uh, uh, like that, which are the weaknesses of some of the stories that, that you see that are said in that, uh, uh, in that era. Um, and also, I myself, in writing the book, went on a kind of voyage of discovery, trying to understand what the life of free black, black families in Washington and America was like at that time, and I spent a lot of work doing that. But let me make clear, the book isn't meant as history. It's not meant to say, oh, look at Lincoln this way. Oh, look at black people that way. It's uh, supposed to be a legal thriller. It just happens to be set in a different uh, era. It's supposed to be fun to read. I certainly had more fun writing it than any of my other uh, uh, novels. Uh, my wife, if she were here, could tell you that when I write it, I, I do a lot of writing, as you heard. I write a lot of nonfiction. I write a lot of articles for op-eds and things like that. I write a lot of scholarship. Fiction drains me in a way that other writing doesn't. I don't know why. It's, it's emotionally exhausting. This was the first novel I've written that I had fun writing as opposed to feeling this, this weird, uh, almost evil compulsion uh, to, uh, uh, to finish. So that's all I'm going to say about the novel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention three of the most commonly asked questions. Then I'd like to spend the rest of the time answering your questions, whatever they may be. So three of the most commonly asked questions. One of them I can summarize uh, quite easily. I did an interview, uh, the, one of the early interviews I did about the novel uh, on NPR. Uh, the host uh, began the interview. He said some very nice things about me and my work and my background, how much he enjoyed some of my, thing, some of my work. And then he said, but, but Professor Carter, the impeachment of Abraham Lincoln? Where do you get off? That's what he said. And I, I think what people are getting at is there, there's a sense of, come on. And so a question that I've been asked a lot is, as I worked on a book in which impeachment, in, in which Lincoln faces impeachment, did it change my view of Lincoln? Because I always say I'm a big Lincoln fan. The answer is yes, but interestingly, my respect for him only increased. And it had nothing to do with the things he did wrong. And I do think he did th some things wrong. And one of the mistakes we often make in politics is assuming that our guy never does anything wrong. Everybody does lots of stuff wrong. We all do. We do in our daily lives. People with power do. People without power. People without power just with power just see it more. You know that's that's life. That's being human. Lincoln made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of things I wish he hadn't done. But the way that he struggled, the genuineness of the struggle, and in particular his own moral growth in office, which is the most remarkable I think of anyone who's ever held that office, I really came to admire enormously. So that's one question I get a lot. Second question I get a lot uh, uh, can be boiled down as two sides. How long did you take to write this? What kind of research uh, did you do? 
I first remember discussing this book with my editor um, before the Amber Motion Park even came out. So this is, we're talking 11 years ago, I had the idea. I've been, been working on it for about five years. I actually published another novel while I was working on this one. Uh, and as to the research, the research was enormous. The research was enormous. Um, not just in terms of reading histories, but reading all sorts of primary documents uh, from narratives and diaries and correspondence of people who lived at the time to things written by uh, Lincoln and, uh, and by his contemporaries, looking at maps of Washington, D.C., reading accounts of life in Washington, D.C., trying to get the, the streets right, the views right, the sounds right, even the smells of Washington I wanted to get right. And of course, discovering in the Library of Congress the report from 1865 of the Provost Marshal General of Washington, D.C., of, of the Union Army in Washington, D.C., on the quality of brothels in Washington was enormously in informative in terms of some of the brothel scenes in the uh, novel. I wanted to get them, uh, uh, them right. But harder than that was getting the voices of the characters right. Getting Lincoln's voice, even though the Lincoln's name is in the title, he only appears in seven scenes in the entire uh, book. But I wanted in those scenes to get his cadences as close to right as I could. Um, I know, I, I, I'm sure it's not perfect, but I worked hard on it. A lot of things he says in the book or things he said on other occasions that I just borrowed and put into the story. Uh, he tells a lot of funny stories in the book, but I only use stories that are sufficiently well sourced that I think we can say with confidence Lincoln really said them. There are a lot of stories attributed to Lincoln that never showed up until 1930. That, that's actually a, a common uh, uh, problem. With the other characters, I also worked hard calling out Ezra to get their voices right. But so for example, uh, August Belmont, who was one of the wealthiest men in America at the time, makes an appearance midway through part one of the book. And in getting his voice, I used speeches that he gave. Spe he, he was a very prominent uh, pro-war Democrat, which was a rare species. And I used a lot of the speeches he gave on that and other issues to try to get his cadences right in the one scene in which he appears uh, in uh, the story. So there's a lot of research, but the research is actually fun. And I really felt that I learned a lot um, um, uh, from that process. The third uh, question I thought I'd mentioned that I, I got a lot on tour it, it's hard to find exactly the way to, um, uh, uh, to word it. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess the best way, way to word it would be, would be something like this. Um, what are you trying to say? What's your message for today? Well, there isn't one. I want to make that very clear. It's just a story. And it's supposed to be fun. And that was why... I wrote it. And people have found all kinds of messages and parallels. And good for you. I think that's wonderful. I'm sure they're all there. Hunt them down to your heart's content. But for me, I didn't have any message. I really was trying to write a story. And there was nothing else. And I hope it's a story that you all enjoy reading. Let me stop there and take questions uh, that you might have. And there's, there's two microphones. And I've been told I should ask you to come to the microphone if you have a question, and to please uh, ask it in the form of a question. You know, there are so many people who are going to question that by saying, now, I have something I need to say. There's that, that, so that that's all, but, but go on. No, go ahead. No, no, I said people begin questions that oh. way sometimes. OK, well, I was going to ask you my stock question, which I love to hear from writers, is what is your typical day of writing? And how does it go? Do you get up in the morning and, like, just like I said last Friday, you have 10 cups of coffee first or right at night in the morning? And the other thing I want to tell you is that I love the way you see things. And oh. I love the way you communicate that. And I was here and I saw you four years ago. And I saw you here, and this is when Barack Obama was running for president. But I have used this, I quote, you several times in political uh, debates with uh, friends and acquaintances. And at the end, I always come up with your famous quote, which was, hey, you guys, when he looks out over a crowd, he sees his mother. And I never forgot that. <laughs> but my point I'm trying to say to you is that I love the way you see things. Well, you're very kind to say so. As, as to the question about how I write, um, my typical writing day is not something I would recommend to anyone who wants to be a writer. And I make that very clear. This is how my wife would describe my typical writing day. If I'm going to spend a day writing, I get up about 7 o'clock, I eat a fruit bar and some nuts, and I go in my study. And, you know, sometime around 9 or 10 o'clock at night, uh, my wife says, you know, I'm going to bed. Do you want any dinner or anything like that? <laughs> 
Um, and I say, really? Is it lunchtime already? Um, that, I think, is how my wife would describe my typical writing day. Writing fiction for me is obsessive. When I'm writing fiction, it's, I, I really am like that. I lose track of everything around. When I'm writing nonfiction, whether it's a, a, a book or an op-ed or a scholarly article, it's not that it's easy, but I don't have the same sense of losing track of what's around me. When I write fiction, I do. I, I do, and that may be, I, I don't know which is cause and effect, but I find it very exhausting, not so much physically, although it is sometimes, but emotionally exhausting. I'm not sure exactly why. It does, when I do fiction, have an obsessive quality. So, so I published a book last year um, about war. It's one of the areas I, I, I teach and write about the ethics of war, and I published a book about Obama and the ethics of war that came out about a year, a little more than a year ago. And you know, it's not a short book. It's 300 odd pages, 350, something like that. But it was hard to write, but it was straightforward to write. I didn't lose track of things around me as I was, uh, as I was writing. Hi. Uh, I recently read your first book. And uh, I know that this book is a departure from what you usually write. Uh, usually you write about uh, a small minority of the black culture. And I was just wondering, do you ever get any criticism from black critics about writing about this minority instead of the majority? Um, two things ab about that. Um, I, I guess you could say a small minority of the culture. Um, I'm actually really fascinated uh, by uh, well-to-do black families, especially those that have been well-to-do for, for generations, not an experience I knew much about when I started um, uh, doing this. And it's a fascinating, these stories are fascinating. And, and really, when you look at the burdens, even after slavery, even after Jim Crow, that the country has laid on the back of African America, the accomplishments of some of these families are astonishing. And that's, I think, is why I write it. I think it's something that, needs to, that deserves to be Celebrate. This wasn't really a departure, though, because I'm writing about Abigail's family. Interestingly, I write about a family that's been, in the 1860s, been free for several uh, uh, generations. And since you brought this up, I'll mention, because someone asked, asked me at a couple of signings, but in all your other novels, there's always a character or two from some other novel who finds their way in. So is that true here? Novels in 1867, the answer is yes. There is a character in this novel that was mentioned in and connected to a character in another novel. I'm not going to tell you who they are. But there, but there is, there, I always do have those uh, connections. Do I get criticism from, from uh, black readers? Um, I don't, not much. I, I think if people didn't like it, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't read it. Um, I, so they wouldn't have occasion to criticize me. I, I did have, um, I, I occasionally get, get a couple of reporters have asked me questions that are on the verge of that kind of criticism, but not, not really, no. I think that, I think other people are as fascinated sometimes by these people as, uh, as I am. Thank yeah, you. I was, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question with regard to some of the research that you talk about now if you're writing historically and a little bit with fiction, I'm sure that you have some wiggle room to maybe take things off in a little bit different direction. But Can when you, you lean closer to the mic? Yeah. When you were looking to get some of the finer points of detail historically for this particular book and maybe running into some walls where you weren't finding a lot of research, what do you do to get unstuck? And the second part of that is uh, with regard to social communications now. Do you use that at all to try to find connections to things, or do you think that that plays a role in today's writing habits for when trying you think to social, do you mean like the You mean like Facebook, yeah. things like that? Yeah, oh. reaching out and connecting right. to a global audience. Um, uh, let me answer the questions in reverse. Um, it, I'm not, you know, I, I have a Facebook page, and it's a very exciting one, and you should all be my friends. But. <laughs> But I, I, I would be lying if I said I spent a lot of time reaching out in that sense. I sometimes uh, will talk to, and I did with this book, I talked to some professional historians, some Lincoln scholars, and also some legal scholars who work on things like impeachment and the war power and things like that. I talked to a fellow who actually was, who was writing a book about Lincoln and the war power, and those things were very, very helpful uh, 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 to me. Uh, but it is a challenge, when, but not just with historical fiction, with fiction generally. It's true, you hit a wall, you don't know what it's like. And I'll give you an example in this book. There's a scene in this book when Abigail, having tried to fight her way upward in society, is finally invent, invited to one of these uh, fancy parties that people had every weekend in Washington then, and I suppose they do now, except now, you know, the parties are in Georgetown, which in those days was a bunch of shanties. That was where the freed slaves and the poor whites lived, and nobody went there after dark or even before dark if they could... Uh, that's why the houses are so small. You know that? The lots are very tiny, because there were shanties on those uh, lots. That's why they're so small. Uh, 
So I had that scene, and, and there I hit a wall. That is, I had, could find a lot of stories about black people being invited to various parties, but nothing about the interactions. But I tried to do that the way I would do it in any other fiction. It's generated by the personalities I'd already given the characters. That was what I try, how I tried to fill it in. Did I fill it in successfully? You're the readers. You'll have to figure, figure that out. But you're right. That does occur um, uh, a lot. I am a Facebook friend, by the way, just so you know. Thank you. <laughs> um, this question sort of dovetails with the two of the others. Um, first, you write a lot of, uh, in your writing day. How do you sort of compartmentalize the part of your head that's glued to fiction and writing fiction and writing nonfiction? And at what point, this may be a version of the previous question, at what point do you kind of let go of the factual things you've accumulated over your research and just let the imagination go? Uh, at what point, what, what's the point where that begins to be at variance? Uh, I, I should, to answer that question, let me say something else about my writing style. Um, when I write a novel, and this is not how I write nonfiction, when I write a novel, I always follow the following process, or some close version of it. The first thing I ask myself is, who do I want to write about? I come up with characters. And I knew I wanted to write a novel uh, about Abigail before I knew it was going to be the same as the novel I've interested in writing about Lincoln. Um, so I first asked myself, who do I want to write about? Having decided who I want to write about, with no further thought of plotting, I sit down and I write the end of the novel. I always write the end first. Because I ask myself, I want to, and then I have a plan. I want this person to get there. And if I can't think of an ending, I write something else. I don't, I say, I'm, that's I, not the novel to write. I write a novel when I have an ending. Once I've written the ending, I write the beginning. Um, and I want to emphasize that in, so five novels, all five of them, the ending, with obviously some changes, the basic ending is the one I wrote originally. Four of the five novels, the beginning is the one I wrote originally. The only one where I wrote, rewrote the beginning and didn't use the original beginning was my third novel, Palace Council. Other than that, all of them have the original basic beginning, the old original basic ending. Then I write an outline of a, of a story that would get the characters from the beginning to the ending. I write it. When I'm satisfied with an outline, I put it aside. I never look at it again. Because the point of the outline is to tell me that I have a story I could tell. But I don't know if the story I'm going to tell until I sit down and start developing the characters. Because I admit, one of the deficiencies in the way that I write fiction is I'm the kind of person I have the problem that Kurt Vonnegut wrote about in Breakfast of Champions, one of his greatest novels, that by the time I get to chapter three, the characters are arguing with me. I don't want to go there. I'm not that kind of person. I wouldn't say that. No, really, that, that's what happens. My wife will tell you, she hears me talking to myself. She says, who are you talking to? And she says, oh, no, not again. That's, this is literally what we have this conversation. Um, and so I'm arguing with the characters. They want to do something else, and they tend to get their way. Um, and, and I'll tell you, you know, when I first started writing fiction, my publisher said, you know, you should be writing a book a year. You should be one of these people who, you know, you can make all this money, do all this stuff, if you just write a book every year. And, and I couldn't, and here's, this is why I couldn't write it, it's for that reason. I, I went to a book signing um, shortly after my first novel came out. I went to a book signing on Martha's Vineyard um, by someone who was writing a book every year at that time. And there was a, I sat way in the back, and I had a question about at the very end. I asked her, I said, well, you talked about your writing process, and... Uh, you said that uh, you talked about your outline and so on. So I have a question for you. I, I said, some writers, I didn't say I was a writer. I said, some writers find their characters sometimes take over the story and they have to leave their outline. Do you ever find that? She said, no, she said. <laughs> and that's why. You know, if, if you have that kind of discipline as a writer, you can turn out things much faster. And I suspect without the same kind of emotional exhaustion that I, uh, that I suffer. Um, yes, you talked a little bit earlier about um, trying to get Lincoln's voice. Well, one of the things that I've noticed in all of your books is that you have very strong female characters. And I've never seen a male writer better at getting inside the head of a female character and actually depicting that point of view. And I was wondering, how, is that something you've worked at? Is that something that's just intuitive to you? And in general, how do you get to the voice of your various characters? I don't know. Um, let, let me, let me I, I'll tell you something about the process. When, when my first novel came out, um, uh, most people who read it really liked it, but some people said, well, I don't like the way you portray women in this book. People said, people said and I tried to explain to them, it's not how I portray women, it's how my protagonist sees women. Nevertheless, somebody said to me at a book signing, 
um, you know, you should try doing that story. Um, and if you remember, my first novel was told by a fellow named Misha who had a very uneasy marriage with his wife, Kimmer. And someone said, what, asked me at a book signing, what would that story look like from Kimmer's point of view? So my second novel, where there was a, a marriage that was difficult for a different reason, about half the novel was told in the point of view of a woman in that marriage. I was interested in exploring that. And I just started uh, uh, trying to write that uh, with a lot of help, I should say, from my wife who reads these things and tells me when I'm going way off uh, <laughs> base. She reads my drafts so many times. I can't, I, I don't know how she gets any work done of her, uh, uh, of her own. Um, but I, I actually find, I don't know quite how to put it. I, I find writing women more interesting than writing men. I'm not sure exactly why that's so. I'm not saying I write it better than I write men, write men and, and I, I, I'm flattered about what you said. I don't know if I write it better than other people do, but I find it more interesting writing women than writing men. And I've always believed, I, I, occasionally someone asks the kind of how dare you uh, question, but I've always believed that the project of human communication demands us to imagine other people's point of view. I, I, I don't like you know, essentialism, you know, black people can't write white characters, white people can't write black characters, and so on, and so on. Uh, when, um, when Styron wrote The Confession of Nat Turner, and there was a lot of flack, and they said, you can't write a black person. You know, James Baldwin at the time was, of course, a good friend of his. He was, at the time, struggling to write a novel uh, whose protagonist was white, and the whole novel was controlled by that point of view. And he said, you know, if you can't write that, I can't write this, was, was, what, he, was what he said. And I think, uh, and, and, and so if you think I do it well, I'm, I'm grateful to hear that. It's something I certainly work at, and I'm glad that it's working well. Because my next, I'm writing another novel. Uh, my next novel, um, under my own name, also writing no, some, I'm starting some other lines of novels, but my next novel under my own name is also told, is, is, takes place in 1962 around the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and it also involves a black woman. Um, how do you get a black woman involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, how do you get a black woman involved in Lincoln's impeachment? You know, you, it's a story. You make it up. That's, <laughs> that's all. Yes. I, I think you may have answered my question, but I was wondering, is there anything specific or historic Can you fact? Closer to the microphone. Is, is there anything specific that may have, uh, that inspired Abigail's story? I, I, I heard you earlier explain that there were probably seven or eight members, black members of the bar at that time. And yeah. uh, usually the, the, the black legal fraternity starts with Charles Houston or some story like that. And I was wondering, is there anything specific that you'd ever come across? That inspired um, what inspired me with Abigail's character? Well, again, I, I'd always wanted to write a novel set in this time. I've always wanted to write about three black families at that time. But also the fact that, you know, uh, my grandmother was a lawyer in New York in the 1930s. Um, and I always wondered uh, what it must have been like. Um, she was the second or, pro I'm sorry, she's the third black woman lawyer in New York State. Uh, and I always wondered what that must have been have been like, and when she was alive, I didn't know anything about any of that. That was all stuff I learned after, uh, after, long after she died. And, and so I guess that maybe that was part of my thinking about a young woman, what, what would make someone imagine, especially in a world where no women were lawyers anywhere in the country. There were some women at the time who were trying to become lawyers. There were several, but there were no female lawyers. They said several states had formal bars. Most states, by the way, did not by rule bar black people from being lawyers. The fine abolitionist, abolitionist state of Pennsylvania did, but most states uh, didn't. Even most southern states had no rule. They just didn't have anybody who they would have admitted to the bar. I, 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 it just came to me as an interesting uh, notion, an interesting career choice, you might say, because it was something that would be so foreign to anyone who would imagine she could possibly uh, do it. Just really no more than that. And, and the second part is uh, in Michael's character. Uh, I just never. No, don't say anything that's going to give any part of the story away. <laughs> okay, okay. This is very important, but. I just. You know, I had never heard a, of, a, it was a, of a group with, with his character's mission. Oh, I see. Well, let me, I'll, I'll say a word about, uh, about that. Michael is, um, uh, Michael is, is Abigail's younger brother. Um, and one of the things that he is involved in uh, is black vigilantes who try to protect against the Klan and the white camellia and the other night riders of the day. This is something that white farmers did, um, especially in Virginia and North Carolina. They may have done it elsewhere as well. Those are the ones I happen to, uh, 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 to know about. So that actually is, that's real history. And, and you're, I'm glad you raised it. That I tried to introduce some little corners like that to talk about the variety, actually, of, uh, of the experience. So, thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Carter. Uh, the law which, the section law which establishes the House of Representatives as third in line to the president in case anything happens to Bush. But that was passed in the 20th century in the Truman administration, so it wouldn't apply to your novel. 
I know you don't want to get store, don't want to get spoilers, but I assume at some point the Congress is going to pro that's trying to pass league is going to pass some sort of law figuring who's going to be in charge. Oh, yeah. of I don't I don't mind answering that. That's a good question. I should have mentioned that before. Uh, yes, that the the current provisions that we have about secession were entirely because Truman had a person he wanted to become his successor if, if he and the vice president should both die. Um, at the laws existed at the time. You have to understand the Constitution provides only for the vice president to succeed the president and then says that Congress can establish the order of who else will succeed to the duties of the presidency. That was the Constitution that stood, it's been changed a bit, but that was as it stood at the time. The law that existed at the time, the Presidential Succession Act, provided uh, that in the case of the president and the vice president both being unable to serve, the president pro tem of the Senate, who is now fourth in line, was third in line. So I kept that from real history, because in real history, with Lincoln being dead, Andrew Johnson became president, there was no vice president. The president pro tem of the Senate was a very big radical Republican and a very ambitious man named Ben Wade who despised both Lincoln and Johnson, especially despised Johnson, often with reason. Um, but in my story, so Wade is still president pro tem and he still would succeed to the presidency should um, Lincoln be uh, impeached. And there's a scene right at the beginning of the novel, someone asked about uh, Abigail's brother Michael. A scene right at the beginning of the novel when Michael is talking to Abigail and she's explaining that, um, that Benjamin Wade, the president pro tem of the Senate, would become president. And he said, do you mean to tell me that one of the people who gets to vote on whether to remove him from office also will become president? And she says, yes. And he says, whose idea was that? And she says, the people wrote the Constitution of the United States. And he says, the white people who wrote the Constitution of the United States, right, is basically his, uh, his answer, which is a kind of a non sequitur for him to say. But it is a, you think about it, it's a slightly crazy system that the president pro tem could succeed, which could succeed, succeed the, the, to the presidency. But the fact that the Constitution leaves it to Congress to establish the line of succession is actually an important reminder of the extent to which the framers believed that the process of impeachment was mainly a political, not a legal process. And you can find in the debates a lot of discussion about it as a way to remove a tyrant uh, from office. And in real life, some of Lincoln's strongest opponents, especially Senator Sumner from Massachusetts, who's another man I very much admire, but Senator Sumner's opposition to Lincoln largely rested on the amount of power Lincoln had gathered into his hands. Sumner thought, this is in real life, that uh, he had gathered more power than the leader of a constitutional republic ought ever to be permitted to have. That was Sumner's view of what had happened. Yes. Hello. Um, well, it's time for one more question, I'm told. I'll get yours. If, if you're, these are both real short, I'll squeeze both into the government. Very, very short. Just very, very, short. very excited uh, to, to be here. I want, want you to think about a Stephen Carter in the year 2065. My question is this. I want to believe that the, your path to success is not so unique that it does not exist for the Stephen Carter of 2065. What do we as a nation have to do to ensure that there is a pathway to success that you have enjoyed that is available for that little black kid in a DC neighborhood now that in 2065 can be standing where you are? Educate everybody, that's all. It's not, that's not complicated. And this is without regard to what you think. <laughs> it's without regard to what you think is the best plan. People have different ideas, but that's the idea. Whatever it may be, you, some people think public, some people think private, some people want to spend money on this or that. But whatever the debate is, that's the debate we should be having. What is the best way to make sure that every kid gets and the education that, uh, that gives them a chance? That, there's, there's no substitute for it. And you have the last one, but real short, I'm told. Uh, just a question about historical fiction and using history, but then fictionalizing it, and sort of the tension between wanting to show history correctly versus Im imparting it in a novel. So, curious if you have something. Well, to uh, two very quick points about that. Um, this is not my first foray into historical fiction. That would have been my novel, Palace Council, uh, in 2008, which includes as characters Richard Nixon and John Kennedy, among others. It takes place largely in the 50s and, and 60s and early 70s. Um, but this was much harder. The two things I'll say is this, that, that as my training is, my professional training is as a scholar. And so that means that even writing historical fiction, I have a very deep urge to get the background facts right. The image, the city, the law, the way people talk. I cheated a little on the way people talk, which I mentioned in the author's note at the end. Um, 
But aside from that, it, it's just a story and it's an invention. And I don't mean to suggest that the people in the story really would have reacted this way if these things had happened. I just want it to be plausible to the reader. They could have reacted this way. Because again, I want to emphasize, I'm not supposed to be teaching history. It's just supposed to be fun to read. Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.